Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, as, do they call you Mrs. Karen? Miss Karen. Miss Karen. Yeah. Mrs. Scully, okay. Either one. Yeah. As Miss Karen said, my name is Zach Weaver. I'm the pastor of Liberty Vineyard Church, and um, we're just down the street here from, from there. But she's asked me, I guess I'm the first one in this group, to, um, to come in and a group of us that are, have different areas of expertise to come in and speak to you all about influencing the culture for Christ uh, through various aspects of, of, of life. And so mine is to influence the culture for Christ through the church. But I want to start off with a story today. So when I was 19 years old, uh, I was in college. I was, a, uh, I was a music major in college, went to college to study the French horn, um, was going to be a performance major in that. And I went there and took lessons on the side as for piano. That was kind of my fun side instrument. And I met this teacher. Uh, his name was Dr. B. Every, his name was Dr. Breckenridge. Everybody called him Dr. B. And Dr. B, without meaning to, changed the whole trajectory of my life. He, he was a, a, an amazing teacher, but he realized some gifts in me that I didn't realize I had myself. And he spoke some very simple truths into my life and, and taught me some things that changed the course of my life forever. So instead of going into horn uh, performance, I ended up going into piano performance. And then from there, I ended up becoming a teacher. And I've been teaching piano now for almost 20 years, uh, professionally. I've done that full-time for almost 20 years. I still do it to this day. I absolutely love it, but it's because of this one man's influence that I moved into that position. It was a man, I mean, he barely knew me, and I barely knew him, but because of him, I've had the chance to impact hundreds of lives um, through music for, for, like I said, for almost 20 years. When I was 30 years old, I gave my life to Christ. And an, another man that will come and speak to you. When does Johnny come to speak? Uh, maybe December, I forget. December, okay. Yeah, December December. Another man who was the pastor of the church at the time that I went to spoke, took about five minutes out of his time and spoke a truth into my life that absolutely changed the course of my life from that day forward. So even though I still teach music, because of him, I'm able to be here today. Because of him, I, I speak to you the way I can today. Now, because of him, I'm able to influence lives in an entirely different way. I'm able to be a pastor and to be able to lead people to Christ and to be able to influence in, with a different way, not any, with more of a purpose. These are two different people, two different random times in, in my life, in two completely different places that entirely changed my life forever. You never know the power that you have to change a life. You never know the influence that you have over someone's destiny, over their future, over their trajectory in their life. My hope and my prayer is that today, by the end of the talk, that you will realize that. You will realize the power that you have to do that. When we think about the church's role um, in influencing the culture, you know, you might think of things like, oh, putting on a fall festival. I know a lot of churches do that. You might think about having um, a bake sale to raise money for a certain, uh, for a charity or for an event that's going to go on. You might think about, you know, raising funds to send kids to, to youth group or to church camp or something like that. You might think of feeding the homeless. I know with our church, we, um, we contribute school supplies to needy kids in the area for... Um, so that they'll have the supplies that they need. And I think the tendency, if you ask most, most people just generally, would say that the church uh, is really like an organization. It's a, it's a building. Um, it's a gathering place. You know, when you think of the church, you usually think of going to a place. And that's the idea, the traditional idea of church. And I think we tend to think of the pastors, the ministers, the teachers, and the leaders that these are the ones, the people that are full-time ministry, or at least the lay leaders, we call them in church, that they're the ones that are really actively doing the work of the ministry, that they're the ones that are uh, actively involved in reaching out to the people. But what I want to share with you today is that the real job of the church, the real job of the full-time ministers, is to equip you, to equip the people that go. You see... I don't know if you know this or not, 
And it took me a long time to understand it. But the church isn't a building. The church isn't an organization. It's not a gathering place. The church is you. We're the body of Christ. And it's not, uh, it's not for spe- a specific people or for professional ministers. It's for each one of us. And the job of the quote-unquote full-time or professional ministry is to teach and to train and to minister ourselves to the people, to people like you, to people like Miss Karen, to people all around, to minister ourselves out of a job. Let me give you an explanation for that. I'm, like I said, I teach piano. When I teach piano, my whole goal, I have one focus. My job is to teach myself out of a job. So I know that I've done my job well when my students don't need me anymore. When they can be self-sustained, when they can uh, perform by themselves, when they can pick up a piece of music, fully understand it, do it, perform it, they don't need a teacher to tell them how it works anymore. When they can do that, I've done my job well. Sometimes that happens quickly, sometimes it takes a long time, it doesn't matter, but that's my goal. That's my large-scale goal from start to finish, is when they don't need me anymore, I've done my job well. That's the same role as your minister, as your pastor, as your teacher, your youth group leader, your children's director, all of those things. Their goal, their purpose and function in the ministry is to minister themselves, for lack of a better word, out of a job. So that they are equipping and building people to the point that they no longer need, uh, Paul talks about this in the Bible, that they no longer need milk and they're not treated like little children anymore, but they're fully functional, fully equipped adults to go out and do the work of the ministry in the world. See, we have to understand that we're the hands and the feet of Christ. It's regular, everyday people doing extraordinary things by the power of God's grace and His mercy. So I want to walk you through, in the, in the little time we have here, two different roles. First, the role of the full-time, or you might call professional ministry. And then the role of the body. Now I want you to see how these two things function. And I know you, I don't see any Bibles, so I'm pretty sure we don't have Bibles with us today, but that's fine. I'm going to use some scripture. If you want to jot it down to just fact check me, that's fine. But we're going to jump into, uh, our first scripture is going to be in Ephesians. And it's in chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And this is what Paul writes in Ephesians. It says, It was Jesus who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, and some to be teachers. And he did this to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Okay. Now let's, three things that we hear in there. First, there's this group of full-time ministers, these people that are the prophets, that are the teachers, that are the, uh, the ministers, that are the evangelists, the pastors. We kind of think of these as these are people that are called into ministry, like they have that specific direction and calling, right? But listen to what Paul says is their job, their function. It's one, and this is in verse 12, to prepare God's people. Who are God's people? Everyone. All of us that have given our lives to Christ are now God's people, adopted into his family. Two, what does he say that they'll do to prepare God's people for works of service? So it's to prepare the people who will do the service. And third, says, so that the body of Christ may be built up. The body of Christ, that's what we're going to look at in a second, is the church. That it may be built up. What do you think that means, to be built up? Any ideas? Great. So kind of building from a foundation and building upward. Any other ideas? What it, to build up the body of Christ. What does that mean to do? To grow, to expand. Mm, yeah. And I would, I would build on that, that to grow and expand in, in several ways. Like to grow and expand not only in, in growing the size, the number of people as you go out and you reach disciples and you reach other people and they go out and expand, but also to grow internally, individually, and I, I think that's what you were meaning, but yeah. as, as the people of Christ to grow spiritually deeper and deeper into our relationship, like I said with the teachers, teaching ourselves out of a job to the point that now they no longer need to, to be walked and held your hand the whole time. But instead, you can say, 
what Jesus said. You remember, he sends his disciples out. He says, I no longer call you, uh, I call you my friends. And he sends them out and he says, now you, you go do it. See, that's the point. So let me take a second now to move us into the body of Christ. So that's the full-time ministers, what we call the professional, the calling to ministry. Their role is to equip the body to do the work of the ministry. So what does that look like? For this, we're going to go back a couple of books. We're going to look in 1 Corinthians in chapter 12. This will probably be a familiar verse. I'm sure you've heard excerpts from it lots of times. It's chapter 12, verse 12. And I'm going to kind of walk through. This is a long section. I'm just going to take little pieces from it so that we can get the general idea without spending an hour doing this. In verse 12, he says this. Paul is writing and he says, the body is a unit, and he means the body as in our physical bodies, the body that we're all born with, is a unit. Though it's made up of many different parts, and though all the parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. Verse 13, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, and we were all given one spirit. So verse 12 and verse 13 speak of this idea of of one body. And he says in there that we're all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free. What does he mean when he says Jews or Greeks, slave or free? There's a bigger picture that he's trying to convey there. Do you know what he means by that? Don't make it too complicated. It doesn't really matter what your background is. That's exactly it. It's everyone. What he's saying there is that's all they knew at the time, Jew and Greek. That was pretty much, those were the two people. Slave or free. Yeah, it doesn't matter how you were born. It doesn't matter what your, what your background is. It doesn't matter where your strengths and where your weaknesses are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter any of those things because we're all born into one body. When you're born again, Jesus says when you're born again, you are now reborn and we're reborn into the body of Christ. And we go on in verse 14, he says, now the body is not made up of one part, but many. And I'm going to read this quickly. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, and for that reason, would it not be part of the body anymore? Or what if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it wouldn't cease to be a part of the body anymore, and if the whole body were an eye, what kind of sense would that make? What if the whole body were an ear? Where would the sense of the smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Now I want you to hear the truth of that statement. God has arranged the parts of the body. Now the parts of the body are me and you and you and everybody else. We're all the parts of the body. And he has arranged them just where he wants them to be. Strategically, uniquely, specifically placed where he wants them to be. If they were all one part, in other words, if they all did the same thing, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Here's what I want you to take away from that. All the parts of the body are necessary first and significant second. They're all necessary for function, and they're all significant. Think about when you go to the doctor, when the doctor works with you, and when the doctor checks you out. Is it oftentimes the big giant thing like your arms falling off, or your legs being cut off, or your head's missing? It's not these big... What, it's just like this tiny little thing inside, this little germ or this, this little nerve ending that's not working. It's these tiny things we never even notice that impact hugely the body, negatively or positively. It's very rarely the big obvious things that we see that are huge. Now, I'm not saying you don't go to the doctor if your arm's cut off, do that. But it's oftentimes the tiny things that make the hugest impact to us. Okay, now I want to go on and jump ahead. I'm going to skip ahead to verse 27. This is where he really gets down to it. Now you, you is all of us, are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. And in the church of God has appointed first, and here we kind of go back to that other area, some to be apostles, prophets, teachers, workers of miracles, those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration. We don't often think about that one. Like secretary gifts and, and, uh, and uh, accountant gifts. 
and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. And so he talks about all these different roles. And again, just like when he says slave or free, Jew or Greek, what he's getting at is not that these are the only roles and these are the only things that you can do. It's that all different kinds of roles are what people are called to in the body of Christ to make it function and to make it work. That's what he's getting at. It's not meant to be taken so literally that we say, well, I'm not one of those, so I don't count. I can't be used. I'll save that for the full-time ministers. It's not that. Everybody has a role to play. But he goes on. And he says, I will now show you the most excellent way. And then he gets into chapter 13. You've heard this. If you've ever been to a wedding, you've heard this. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm just a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Anybody ever heard a gong or a cymbal? Yeah. By itself, it can be um, distracting, sometimes a little annoying, especially if it happens over and over and over again. If I have the gift of prophecy, can fathom all the mysteries and all knowledge of the world, and if I have faith that could move a mountain, but I don't have love, he says I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and I surrender my whole body to the flames, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. It's all for nothing. You see, the purpose of all of our gifts is love. The purpose of being sent out as the body of Christ to go out into the world and be the people of God, to be the hands and the feet of God, is not to go out and declare this and to show this and to, and to be you know, forceful and angry and all of these things. The purpose of the people of God is to go out and be the hands and feet of God, to go out in love and to love like Jesus loved. We're to go out and we're to influence the culture by being in community, by being in people's lives, by being with our friends and with our family in, near, and around, and mixed up in the whole mess of things. The world has lots of different areas, but to be in there, but not to be influenced, not to be changed, but to keep that unique quality, that quality that makes you, you. That part of the body that you function to be, not to get out into the world and feel distracted or feel lost or feel overwhelmed, not to get out into the world and see other people operating in their gift and say, if I only operated like they did, or if I could just be a little better like them, but to see that your unique quality stands out as different and special and specific in the way that nobody else can. And we refuse to give in to the world. We refuse to let the world influence us into such a way that we no longer operate or function in the body. Think of how Jesus lived. He stood against the common practices of his day. Right? He looked into his society and there was a prevailing culture. A culture that said, these people are outcast. These people are accepted because of what they've done. And it sort of had this dividing line. And Jesus came in and said, this is not right. This is not God's will. And he broke down those barriers. And he stood against the things that weren't right in the kingdom. He boldly stood up for what was right. He didn't offend, but he did defend people. He spoke the truth, but he always spoke it in love. He went to the outcast, he went to the sinner, he went to those that needed him the most, and he showed that he cared. You see, we've not only been adopted into the body of Christ, we've been adopted into God's family, we've also been adopted into Jesus' ministry. That ministry of being the hands and feet, that ministry of seeking and saving that which is lost. So I want to propose a really radical thing to us today. That you are all, right now, at the age you are, at the place you are in your life, with the amount of training you have, with everything you know, fully-fledged ministers of the gospel. See, today, right now, you're carriers. Once you know God, once you're in that relationship with Him, you're carriers of the way. You have the knowledge that brings life. See, you're all leaders. I heard Karen just, you guys were talking about the allegory of the cave with Plato, right? Mm -hmm. To those that are in the dark, 
The one that brings the light is the leader. To those people that live in darkness, those that carry the light are the leaders. Those who know the truth are the ones who are able to set the captives free. And that is absolutely true. But now to the crux of the matter. What can you do? What can one person do? Can one person really matter? Can one person really make a difference? See, when we demonstrate the love of Christ in our daily life, through random acts of kindness and grace, we can change the world. I can't tell you the number of times somebody has come to me and said, what you said the other day meant so much to me. Like it really, I was feeling, but you really, and I can't even remember what I said. Because I, I wasn't trying to specifically speak into their lives, but just those words, you don't realize sometimes the power you have to influence someone's life. A kind word spoken to someone, an encouraging word to somebody that's hurting, congratulating somebody on an accomplishment, or just recognizing what they're doing and saying thank you. Thank you for doing that. Loving those that are unlovable. Being kind to those that are unkind to you. Really trying to live out the golden rules. Everybody know the golden rule? Treat others the way that you... Esther doesn't know it. All right. <laughs> Treating others the way you want to be treated. But living that out. Not just saying it, not just doing it when it's easy. But doing it when it's hard. Because when it's hard is when it really matters. See, these are the things that change lives. They may seem insignificant at the time, like when we go to the doctor and it's that tiny little thing. They may seem insignificant, but they can alter the trajectory of someone's life forever. A kind word in a moment of caring speaks volumes to those in need. Remember, we're not trying to change the world. And this is very important. This is important for me to remember. It's important for all of us. We're not trying to change the world in giant leaps and bounds. That is not how Jesus did it. That isn't how the disciples did it. That isn't the model we see. What we see is we try to change the world one person, one group at a time. One life at a time. How can you make a difference in one person's life today? I'm here today because somebody took five minutes to encourage and to motivate me A small amount of yeast, as Jesus says, influences a large amount of dough. My mother-in-law loves to bake bread. And that yeast, it's like a pinch. You ever seen somebody bake bread? You've got dough that's this big in a big container, and it's a pinch of yeast. But it makes the entire dough work. It rises because as it's mixed in, it just begins to grow and grow and grow. That insignificant amount makes a huge impact. So... The practical application. First, if you want to do this, you have to get into the Word. You have to commit yourself to growing deeper and closer to God. Get into, if you're in your youth group, get into a small group. Get into, into community and life so you can build and encourage each other. Second, I'm going to tell, your, um, tell you, your, I'm going to be your pastor's best friend for a minute. Um, look around and see the need in your community. See where there's something that you can do, that you feel like you want to do, but you're not sure you can do it alone. Gather some people together, or just go to your pastor and share your vision. Share your heart. Say, I don't know if this works or not, but I, I was just thinking about this, and I wonder if there's a way I want to get more involved. If you go to your pastor and just say, I, I really, I don't know how, but I really want to help, I'll just tell you, your pastor's waiting for you to do that. He's waiting for everybody to do that. I'll be your pastor's best friend today. That's, that's secretly what every pastor says. Oh, please come and tell me you want to help. Please come tell me that you need me to do something, that you have something for me to do. Go. Oh, it's not for them to do. It's not for the other people to do. It's for us to do. Make a decision today to stand out from the culture. Make a, a decision today to be salt and light on the earth. I'm just going to close with this. We influence the culture for Christ when the people of God recognize that they are not becoming, 
not someday, but now, that they, you, are the hands and feet of Christ, living out your faith in the unique gifting in everyday situations. Regular, ordinary people with no unique training. Remember what they said about the disciples? We recognize these men have no special training. Yet they changed the world. Ordinary people being salt and light in a world of darkness. We influence the culture for Christ through the church when we remember that the church isn't an organization. It's not a building. It's not a gathering place. It's us. We are the church. We are the body. When we function, everybody playing their roles, everybody operating in their unique gift set, when we do this, we will experience the full measure of the influence of the church in our culture, both within its walls and within the surrounding community. That's it. Okay. Right, so do you have some, does anyone have any questions? For yeah, that'd be great. And, questions or comments? Yeah. What time's your class end? <clears throat> well, we go on a little longer, but... Um, okay, I didn't want to yeah, take up your time. Yeah, I wanted to give time. you guys a chance to respond or yeah, comments, questions, observations, thoughts. <laughs> That's a good thing from Dawson. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Well, let me kind of push us off just for a second then. What... What are some ways? What are some ways that you can think of just practically? And I, again, you don't need to think. That's the, the mistake I think we make a lot of times is thinking so grand that it almost seems, seems impossible. What are some ways that we can just, on a regular basis, uh, do this, influence the culture for Christ as the body, as the church? How can we do that? Bring your friends to church. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's bringing your friends to church. That's it. What else? Mm, yeah, going out in the community, right? That's it. That's a good way to get community going too, with the with the in the church itself, just to get with other people and do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else? Just getting to know people in general, just going deeper and know their story, even know where they're coming from, so you can relate to them. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, because it's in those moments that's when all of the that's when the real changes happen. It's when somebody takes the time to really get to know you. Mm -hmm. mm. What else? Oh yeah, that's that is huge. I'll tell you a quick story. My uh, my um, I, my my mother-in-law and, and father-in-law live with live with my wife and I in our house, and they um, they went out. We have a, a family in the church that just started coming to church. They've only been coming. Oh, I don't know. They've been to church maybe two times, but we found out that over the week. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, we hadn't seen him, and so we called him to check on them, and we found out that the guy's grandmother had passed away. Mm -hmm. He had contracted a kind of a disease and had to go to the hospital for a while. They had had a sick child, no, two sick children, and something, something else. I can't even remember what the other thing was that had happened. All of this happened in like the span of two weeks. I had already called him like earlier just to check on him, and so I didn't want to keep pestering and bothering him, but my mother-in-law took the time to call to reach out actually I think to email the mom and she got that response back that said all of those things and so then yesterday they went over to the house brought some food just sat with them talked with them listened to them I guarantee that means more than any sermon I'll ever preach it means it means more than anything else because that's the kind of stuff that's what changes people's lives it's when they see wow somebody cares somebody noticed that I wasn't there somebody noticed um, and cared enough to bring to, to take time out of their life, because we're all busy, mm -hmm. to take time out of your life. I'm not talking about you have to give every minute of every day to this. Five minutes, mm -hmm. ten minutes, that's all it takes. Yeah, that's fantastic. What else can you do? Anything else? Any other thoughts? I asked my mom in the car yesterday if she could give me one of those, uh, like, things to pick up trash. Oh, like, <laughs> one of those grabbers? Yeah. I, um, I want, uh, like, I want to get a couple of friends and, like, clean up around the church. That's, That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. See, that, and, and doing that, that may be something that nobody even knows that you do, but it'll make a huge impact, and somebody mm -hmm. will notice. Mm -hmm. Maybe it not, maybe not everybody, but somebody will notice, and that'll make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Just think about things like, Going visit, if you have a friend in the hospital, if you have somebody that's sick, going and visiting them. 
just picking up the phone, giving somebody a call. I know in culture today it's a lot easier to either email, text, or, or to Facebook, or, or uh, any, anything like that, just some, a, a quicker way. I don't know if it will be, but for me, a phone call takes a lot more time and a lot more effort, even though it may only be a minute or two. That's something that can really, really help. Just thoughts for that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Go ahead. All right, well, let's give him a big round of applause. Thanks, Thanks. so much, Jack. I sure. really appreciate you of coming. Of course. Oh, I, I loved it. It was fun. Yeah, yeah.